Porch, how we doing? Come on, come on. Man, I love worshiping with the band. I don't know where you're at, Fort Worth or Houston or, or wherever you're gathering. I hope, Hopefully you just uh, were able to worship the Lord uh, through some gifted musicians. Can we just thank the band who point us to Jesus? It's awesome, man. It is awesome to be pointed to our creator uh, with those guys. Anybody here in, in a band? Like, those guys are so cool. I mean, they're in band. I, I, I was in band, like, when it wasn't so cool to be in band. Anybody else? Anybody else in band? Like, that? You, you, you're proud of it? Like, yeah, yeah. No, you don't, have to, you don't have to do this. Do this. Like, yeah, I was in band. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you play? Percussion. Trumpet, percussion. I... I played percussion. That's, that's just a fancy way to say drums, you know. I, I wanted to be like those guys who played the quads, you know. Anybody, you know, those guys. I, I went and I got my snare drum and uh, go and you, you get it. And there I was in sixth grade. I had my snare drum and I, I was so excited about it. And, and uh, I don't want to brag, but for the first couple of weeks, I was first chair uh, every week. No big deal. Don't treat me different, okay? Um, <laughs> just a normal guy, first chair. And, uh, and I remember my sister loved Metallica. And uh, she, she was my older sister. She loved Metallica. Metallica's drummer was so amazing. His name was Lars. He was just, would just go off on the kit. And, and that's what I thought I was going to be like. So I signed up for band in the sixth grade. Well, then we go to competition and they put me, I heard one of you, you shout it like, like the triangle. Okay. Like that was, that was my role in the competition. All these guys were doing all this crazy stuff on the drums. And I was like, you know, hit some blocks or something. And, and so it, it was, you know, as the, the next two years I was in band, the next two years progressed, here's what happened. I started out first chair, first chair. If, if you weren't in band, that's just a really good thing. And, and then as the weeks went on, the next 24 months went on, I moved to middle chair. And then that kind of next year, I sat in last chair and I stayed there and I never moved on. And here's why. I learned I'm not real passionate about the drums, and because I wasn't super passionate about the drums, I didn't practice like some of my peers did. Like they were passionate. They went home, they practiced every night, they disciplined themselves, they moved on to other percussion instruments. I sat there with the triangle in my last chair because my passion for the drums was waning. You know, I don't know if you know what they're saying about us. The reason I start with that story is because what they're saying is that if we're not passionate about something, then we don't apply ourselves to it. That's what they're saying about our generation. I don't know what you think about that. You can take that and be insulted, or you can inspect your life and, and ask, is it true? Is that, is that something that marks me? Is that something that's true for me? I can remember thinking when I was playing the drums is, is man, this is hard. It doesn't feel natural. And if it doesn't come natural and it seems difficult, it must not be right. Maybe you start questioning yourself, maybe I wasn't made to do this. If I'm not great at it, it, it must not be my thing. Did you know that only 1% of people are naturally, extraordinarily gifted at something? Less than 1% actually. Think genius, think savant, think like be able to, to step up to a piano for the first time and play it by ear. Less than 1% of people. Do you know what that means for us, the other 99 plus percent of people? If we're going to do anything great in this life, it is going to require discipline. That's the truth. If you are going to accomplish anything extraordinary with the days the Lord has trusted to you on this planet, it is going to require you pushing through the discomfort and embracing the grind and disciplining yourself. And so we're in this series, Vice and Virtue. And tonight we're talking about laziness and discipline. Laziness and discipline. Laziness is simply the lack of discipline. I'd ask you right now, do you think you're lazy? Most of us don't think we're lazy. How many of you hope to wake up this morning to look out the window and see a blanket of white snow? Yeah, I, me too. 
Me too. I was excited about that, and I'm glad I'm not the only one. And, and why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you wanted to stay home. You went to bed last night hoping that work would be canceled today. Are you lazy? How many of you made New Year's resolutions? They say 40%. 40% of us made New Year's resolutions. Just for comparison, 33% of us watched the Super Bowl. 40% of us made New Year's resolutions. What were they? They were around disciplines. I'll give you uh, some of the five most popular ones. Be disciplined to lose weight. Be disciplined to exercise more. Be disciplined to eat healthier. Get a better job. Get closer to God actually made the list. And did you know that January 12th is National Quitters Day? That is where, statistically, most people stop their New Year's resolutions. We make it into the year 12 days. Now, I don't know where you're at in that journey, but they say 8% of people keep their resolutions. 92% of Americans stop. Why? Because we're lazy. Because we're lazy. And some of us, have even a work-to-be-lazy mentality. I know you don't think you're lazy because you're busy. And what I want you to know is just because you're busy doesn't mean you're not lazy. The Proverbs actually speak to this idea that we can be doing a lot of things but not progressing, not doing something productive, our life not producing anything great. We're just busy. You've heard of crazy busy. I'm talking about lazy busy. That we would sit, that we would sit, sit in a bunch of motion that we would create a lot of energy, but there would be no productivity. See, some of us have a work to be lazy mentality. We go to work on Monday, waiting for Friday, drudging through the week, hoping to get to that finish line so we can kick up our feet and take it easy. And if you don't believe me on that week to week basis, just think about retirement. Like some of us just think, hey, we're gonna work hard when we're young, hope to make a lot of money, store it up in a 401k, and then kick up our feet and take it easy. Our goal, our literal goal in life is to be lazy. That's what we hope to accomplish with our life is to one day be able to afford to be lazy. Are we lazy? Are we lazy? If you're not convinced, I want to turn to the Proverbs. It's in the Old Testament. It's a book written by kings, most of, mostly the King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Uh, they were it's the book of wisdom. It's principles for us to live our life by. And in the book of Proverbs, there's lots of characters, okay? You have uh, lady wisdom, the, the wise. You have the fool. You have uh, the characters of the scoffers. You have the isolated man. You have the noble woman of Proverbs 31. You have those who are wise in their eyes. You have, and then you get to the one that we're gonna look at this evening called the sluggard. When you hear me say sluggard, think lazy person. The proverb talks about this character about a dozen times. Uh, we'll address most of them. I'm gonna jump around, but let me start here in Proverbs 26 so I can continue to ask the questions. As we move through the Proverbs, we're gonna look at uh, the, the topic of laziness, three things, the cause of laziness, the cost of laziness, what it costs you, because the cost is high. And then before you leave here this evening, the cure uh, for laziness from the Proverbs. So we'll start in here in Proverbs 26. It says this in verse 13. A sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. Now what does that mean? The lazy person says there's a lion in the road. It's a riddle. Sometimes these proverbial sayings are riddles. It's saying that a lazy person will make any excuse not to go to work. There's a lion in the road. There's ice in the road. There's ice in the streets. I can't go. What, what is your excuse? I'm just not passionate about my work, man. I don't believe in the product. My boss is a jerk. They don't give me enough vacation. They don't pay me enough. I, I think I was made for something different. And then verse 14, it says, as the door turns on its hinges, so, the, so a slugger turns on his bed. What, what does this mean? Again, it's a riddle. What does a door hinge do? It moves a lot but goes nowhere. Lots of movement. But it doesn't do anything. The slugger turns on his bed. You can picture the person laying on their bed, rolling over and hitting the snooze button. 
again and again and again. Did you know that if you hit anybody's snooze button, you the snooze this morning? Okay, you're proud of that. Um, <laughs> did you know that if you hit the snooze button for 15 minutes, just 15 minutes a day, if you snooze for just 15 minutes a day, that's 92 hours a year. That's four whole days of sleep at the end of a year. That's you not getting out of bed for four whole 24-hour days. Just hitting the snooze button once, 15 minutes. Like a door hinge. Not going anywhere. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. What does that mean? It's a riddle. It means they don't finish what they start. They don't finish what they start. I tell my kids they can play any sport they want to play, but if we start it, they're going to finish it. My, my daughter this year started playing basketball, and, and before her first game, she broke her finger in two places. Doctor said she couldn't play basketball. She's thinking, oh, season's over. I'm, I'm just not going to be on the team. No, no, no. We're going to go to every game. Because you signed up to play, we're going to finish. You're going to sit on the, on the sidelines. You're going to cheer on your team. You're going to sit with your team. You're going to cheer them on. A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. A sluggard says, I work hard, not smart. I mean, I work smart, not hard. Like a pro will show you they're a pro by what they do. A sluggard, a lazy person says, hey, they're always a coach, never a player. Hey, I know everything about everything. I've done these things. Hey, sit back. Let me tell you how to do it. Let me tell you how good I am. Don't make me show you, though. Don't make me get up from the couch. And so let's just ask some questions before we dive in further. Let's ask some questions from these texts. Verse 13, do we make excuses to get out of discipline? I can't go to work today because I'm hitting snooze because I can't, I can't spend time with God this morning. I'll, I'll do it later. I'll do it this evening. I'll do it before I go to bed. Verse 14, are, are we busy but lack something to show for the busyness? Not getting better, not getting greater, not producing something great. Do we start things but not finish them in verse 15? Job to job. Ambition to ambition, diet to diet, uh, I'm going to work out this time, gym membership to gym membership, hobby to hobby. No, I found the thing. No, it's not the thing. You ever you meet somebody, they're like, dude, I love my job. I've got the best job in the world. i got a new job. It's awesome. And you talk to them like two months later, you're like, dude, how's it going? Oh, I quit, man. It sucked. <laughs> that job was awful. And then you see him again. Oh, but i got a new job. It's awesome. So great. My boss. And then you see him later. How's it going? Ah. Oh, got laid off. It's always something, you know, thing to thing to thing. And why? Why would anybody be lazy? I think it's different than you think. Let's talk about the cause of laziness. My first point, the cause of laziness. You might be tempted to think that laziness is the lack of a desire or the lack of drive. It is not that. Laziness is an intense drive. It's an intense desire. The reason that you hoped that, it would, that the roads would freeze last night is not because you don't have a desire. It's because you had a desire to what? Stay in your PJs all day, sit by a fire, and binge on Netflix. You have a desire for it to be comfortable. Laziness is driven by a deep desire for comfort. Let me show you from the Proverbs. Proverbs 13, verse 4. A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the, filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. In the ESV, it says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. Proverbs 21, verse 25, it says, the craving of a sluggard will be death to them. They have a craving but his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more, but the, righteousness, but the righteous give without sparing. What does a sluggard or lazy person crave? They, craze, they crave comfort. The cause of laziness is a craving for comfort. Write that down. The cause of laziness is a craving for comfort. It's wanting comfort ultimately. Your problem is not laziness. It's the idolatry or the worship of comfort which produces laziness. It's that I don't want to do anything that I don't want to do. It's believing this lie, and this is so popular among us and our peers, believing this lie that, that if it doesn't come completely natural to me, if it's not easy, then I shouldn't have to do it, or maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. And the enemy, he'll convince you of that, and he'll keep you in apathy. 
so that you never produce anything great with your life. There's a lot of examples of this. I think that the ultimate goal of the enemy is that he would just keep you in a place of doing nothing great for the kingdom, nothing great with your life, not living your purpose. There was a, um, an anti-drug commercial in the 90s. It was called Pete's Couch. You can look it up on YouTube later. Maybe you saw it as I did. This was a season of my life where I was doing drugs. I was smoking a lot of weed at this time in my life, and, and, uh, and so I was interested in this commercial because there were so many crazy commercials out there. This is your brain on drugs, scrambled eggs, and whatnot, and that just didn't appeal to me, but this particular commercial, I was like, okay, there's some truth in that, uh, and essentially, they were sitting on Pete's couch, and he's like, you know, and the guy starts talking. He's like, hey, I smoked weed, and, and nothing happened. I didn't die. I, I didn't do heroin. I didn't get in a wreck. Nothing happened. I smoked weed, and you know what happened? Nothing. We just sat on Pete's couch. And then it talked about how, you know, we didn't go mountain biking. We didn't go on a date at the ice skating rink. We didn't do anything great. We did nothing. We sat on Pete's couch. This is a great picture of laziness. What's at risk with laziness? That you would get to the end of this race, and a lot of people would stand up at your funeral, and they would talk about all the great things that you did, except there aren't any. Nothing to say. Man, they were really good at at, um, relaxing. Taking it easy. Man, you know, I remember when they caught the whole season on Netflix. And it was awesome. And there's nothing. Don't be this person, man. You were made for so much greater than that. God made you for incredible purposes that the enemy wants you to miss out on. If you're here, he he has a plan for you. And so let's look at the cost of laziness, right? The cost of laziness. I'm going to give you four P words from the Proverbs. Proverbs 6, verse 11. Poverty will come on the sluggard like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. One of the things that laziness will certainly cost you is prosperity, Remember when you were little and, and maybe you played MASH in the, the third grade or something and, and you thought, hey, when I get older, I'm going to be rich. We all think we're going to be rich. We all think we're going to be millionaires. And you get here and you realize the only way you're really going to be rich is if you work really, really hard. Maybe you were born into it. Probably you're like the rest of us and you're going to have to work really really hard. You're going to have to discipline yourself. Laziness will cost you prosperity. It says, lazy people do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. It's Proverbs 20, verse 4. Laziness costs you progress. You, you won't go anywhere. You won't have anything to show for your work. It's like a door hinge. You're, you're lazy, busy, lots of motion, nothing to show for it. You cannot have any tremendous output without the input of hard work and discipline. That's just a fact of life. That's what's called the law of the harvest. Proverbs 10, verse 26, as vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are sluggards to those who send them. It's saying, hey, these sluggards, these lazy people, they cause frustration to those they work for. They're, they're, they're bitter like vinegar, or they, they, you don't want to be around them. You don't want to look at them like smoke to the eyes. Laziness costs you people's trust or, or reputation. But I think the greatest risk, friends, is let laziness cost you your purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's workmanship. We are his masterpiece. That's, that's a beautiful thing. Just stop for a second to think about that. That there's a God... He's an artist. He's a creator. And he created you. And he made your ears the way they are, and your nose the way it is. He gave your eyes the color they are. He gave you some talents, some skills. Some of you are fast. He made you that way. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. We were created for what? To do good works. That God, the creator, prepared in advance for you to walk in, that that's your purpose. But if you waste your days here pursuing comforts, then you miss out on your purpose. And you don't walk through the good works which God prepared for you to walk through. You stay on Pete's couch. And your life passes you by. See, laziness is feeding your comfort. 
It's not doing anything unless you feel like it. But Christ, he calls us to a different message. He calls us to to embrace discomfort. He says in Luke 9 and also Matthew 16, he he said, Jesus says to them, whoever wants to be my disciple, anybody want to be his disciple? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. What that means is must deny themselves comfort, must, must not just feed their appetites, but must not just do what they want to do. They must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. The cost of laziness is, is not carrying your cross. The cost of laziness is a wasted life. The cost of laziness is a wasted life. That's what's at risk, a wasted life. You won't grow. You won't get better. You won't be great at anything. My wife and I, we have three kids. Our son is five. His name is Weston, and he's been coming in our room at night, like in the middle of the night, like last night at three in the morning which is a terrifying thing to wake up and have a five-year-old staring at you, you know. And, and he's moaning and crying, and, and he's, not a, you know, he's not sensitive. When he's crying, something's wrong. And, and so for the past few weeks, he's been doing this. And I'm like, buddy, what's wrong? He's like, Daddy, my legs hurt. My legs hurt. And so we take him to the doctor, and we're like, hey, he says his legs hurt. Like, what is it, you know? As a parent, you don't want to see your kids in pain like that. And, and you know, my son is probably going to be tall. And the doctor just says, hey, this is growing pains. You know, as his body is producing cells and, that, and, the, and the bones are, are growing and the muscles stretching, as his body is growing, the, those growth plates are shifting and, and it's, he's experiencing some pain. And I was reminded of a boss that I had when I was in the corporate world. He would tell me this. He'd say, JP, you only grow when you're uncomfortable. The only time you grow is when you're uncomfortable. And you think that's true physically, that's true spiritually, that's true personally. You only grow when you're uncomfortable. If you want to grow, you have to press in to discomfort. You have to carry your cross. If you never deny yourself, you are denying yourself growth. If you never deny yourself in the pursuit of comfort, you are actually denying yourself growth. You will not grow personally. Just think about it. I mean, if anybody's New Year's resolution is to get in the gym more, mine was, right? You get in there and you have to press through the discomfort of lifting weights, the discomfort of the class, the discomfort of what you're going through, and as a result, you will grow. You will not grow spiritually. Like some of us have the illusion that one day something's going to happen. We're going to wake up. We're just, we're going to like, it's like God is going to send his Holy Spirit to pull back the covers and to lift us out of the bed and move us to the table and, and set a cup of coffee in front of us. And it's just going to be like coffee with Jesus. It's going to be so rich, you know, and we're just sitting there, you and Jesus, and y'all are just catching up, having a great time. And, and he's teaching you, you know, this word here in the Greek, it means, and you're walking around, you know, like walking away from the Bible, and you just learned it, taught by the Holy Spirit. And, and you, you look back at that, and you're like, man, that was so rich, I can't wait to do it tomorrow. Some of you have that illusion And maybe that happens, or or maybe uh, you enjoyed your quiet time this morning. But can I tell you something? Sometimes it's a grind. It's called a spiritual discipline. That, That you wake up tomorrow even when you don't feel like it. And you study the scripture even when you don't feel like it. And you pray regardless of if you feel like it or not. Like that's what I'm trying to tell you. And I hope you find relief in this. You you don't have to like it for it to be right. You might just do it out of discipline. Some days you might enjoy it. Some days it might be grind. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. You will not grow professionally. Like you might not like your job. You know what a great opportunity is for growth? A job you hate. You might not 
enjoy your job. Do you know that's why they pay you? <laughs> See, if you enjoyed it, you might be tempted to do it for free. And they might be like, hey, we're going to keep our money, and you just keep showing up and doing that thing you enjoy. And it's called a hobby. But they pay you to be there because they know you don't like it. That's, that's the exchange. That's what's going on there, right? And it doesn't matter if you don't like it. Be awesome at it. There's an application for you. Whatever you do, work at it as though you're working for the Lord. Uh, Titus 2.10 says, so that you make the teachings of Jesus our Savior attractive. So you, you be awesome at it. You work to get great at it. I've had a lot of jobs, man. A lot of jobs. I worked at Courtesy Car Wash, wiping down cars. I was a lifeguard. I, uh, I worked at Gadzooks in the mall. It was in my raving days. We don't want to go back there. And then I worked at Champ Sports, slinging them J's, sold tennis shoes for, for like five years, Champ Sports. Got into college, waited tables, uh, did that thing. And, and then I was a graphic designer out of college for a, a short time. Um, I was in business development in corporate America. That's a fancy term for sales. Um, had a lot of jobs. There, I had one particular job that I, that I hated. That's the job I hated the most. It was working for my dad. He, he owned a surveying business. You guys know what surveying is? It's like where you measure land, essentially. So don't think like surveying in Dallas. Like we live in the country. And so surveying was like measuring uh, hundreds or thousands of acres. And so like if I showed you this, like that yellow line there, like we'd have to, to draw that line by putting those two points together. But here was the problem. If you go to the next picture, here's what the landscape looked like. The, the other one. The brush, it was just like thick brush, right? And so they put little JP, you know, 100 yards away, and, and then they would hold this sign that you couldn't see, and then they would give me a machete. And they'd say, hey, you'd have to cut that brush for 100 yards so that it would look like this, the next picture. And, you know, you'd have to cut a line. My job for a summer was literally chopping down brush every single day of my life, and I hated it with all of my heart. I hated it. But I look back on that with fond memories because it taught me to do something I didn't love. It produced in my life work ethic. That when I didn't feel like going to work, and I still had to, it, it taught me that I won't always just want to wake up the next day and, and do whatever the task is before me. I never wanted to do that. But I had to because it was my responsibility because it was my job. And so, I know you were asked a lot when you were younger, what do you wanna be when you grow up? The problem happens when you grow up and you're not what you wanna be. Or you realize you don't really wanna be what you thought you wanted to be when you grow up. The key word there is want. What happens when the want's not there? What happens when the desire's not there? See, what happened in Genesis 3, if you're new to church or the Bible, Genesis 3 is, is, you know, God created the world and he created man and he put man in the world and it was a perfect world and all was right. Uh, in Genesis 3, man chose a way that was different than what God had for him. Sin entered the world. And then it talks about the result of that sin. And one of the specified results is now you will work and it will be hard. Now you're going to work the ground, and it's going to fight against you. A, a result of sin. He, here's, what that, here's the truth about work. Work is supposed to be hard. Today, in this, the fallen world that we live in, work is hard. That's the truth. You know what's interesting about Genesis and work? Work shows up in Genesis 1 when God created man. And he says, hey, I want you to work the ground and subdue it. That's hard work. That's shovel in hand, digging holes, digging ditches kind of work. It's difficult work. But the reality of that being in Genesis 1 is it's before Genesis 3. When God created a perfect world, there was work. Work is not the result of the fall. In fact, you and I will work in heaven. That's the truth. We will have jobs in heaven. And so work is good. Work is hard because of sin. Not because you have the wrong job. Not because you're doing the wrong thing. 
it's hard because of sin. So what's the cure? Let's talk about the cure for laziness. As you consider Jesus' example, think about when he was in the garden. As Jesus was a human, he had to do things he didn't want to do. One of the things that he didn't want to do or didn't feel like doing was going to a cross to be publicly humiliated and tortured to death. The reason he did that was because he loved you and me. But in the garden, when he's talking to the Father, he says, Lord, would you let, Father, would you let this cup pass from me? This thing that you're asking me to do, it's so big and it's so hard. I don't know that I want to, but not my will, your will be done. And we can learn from Christ's example that as we go to work tomorrow, you say, God, this is really hard, but what is your will in it? What would you like to produce in and through my life through this? And, and by Jesus' example, what we learn is simply this. Just because something is hard doesn't mean it's wrong. You've got to leave here with that truth. That just because something is hard doesn't mean it's wrong. And when something is difficult but necessary, it requires discipline. And that's really the application of this message. The cure for laziness is discipline despite difficulty. You can write that down. The cure for laziness is discipline despite difficulty. Proverbs 6 says this, go to the ant, you sluggard, lazy person, look at the ant. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. It doesn't know, it doesn't know or, or care or think about, hey, is this hard? It says, hey, this has to be done, so I'll do it I, I, because I need to do it to live. And so it does it. And so it requires discipline. Professional laziness requires professional discipline. It's learning a skill, developing it, growing in it. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, and, and he came up with this idea that uh, to master something, to be great at anything, requires 10,000 hours. Macklemore later wrote a song about this called 10,000 Hours. He actually references Malcolm Gladwell in the song. He's saying, hey, to do anything great requires 10,000 hours of grind. Not 10,000 hours of pleasure, 10,000 hours of enjoyment, but 10,000 hours of discipline. That you're going to continue to press into the grind. That you're going to honor God in the grind. And so the cure for spiritual laziness is spiritual discipline. That's why they're called spiritual disciplines, reading the word or, or praying or getting in community, going to church, fasting. These are spiritual disciplines. They, they mark your life whether you feel like it or not. So did you wake up this morning, listen, did you wake up this morning and, and spend the first part of your day in God's word? And if you didn't, if you didn't, then I just would challenge you tomorrow to do so. If you're like, man, that's hard. How do I do it? Let me, let me tell you how to do it. Let me break it down for you, okay? Let's, how long do you want to spend in God's Word? Let's just say 30 minutes. Okay, spend a half an hour you know, reading a scripture and praying, asking God to, be, to, to protect you in the day, that you would be faithful in the day, you would do His will in that day. And you say, well, how are we going to do that? So here, whatever time you woke up this morning, just back up your alarm 30 minutes. Okay, back it up 30 minutes. You cool? Some of you are like shaking your hand like, no, I can't do that. Yes, you can. I, pr I promise you can do that. Back it up 30 minutes. Here's, and then here's what I want you to do. You're like, yeah, but I'm just going to hit snooze. No, you're not. We're going to move the alarm across the room. Okay, move it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, some gas. You know, you're going to be okay. I'm walking you through this. Write it down. It's going to be okay. Call me. Actually, call David and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll help you, okay? So, so back it up, back up the alarm, 30 minutes. Now here's the, here's the tricky part. Put the alarm across the room. If it's your phone, if it's an alarm clock, whatever, put it on the other side of the room. You gotta get up to turn it off, okay? Your roommates are gonna hate you. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your Bible on top of your alarm, okay? So that before you turn it off, you gotta pick up your Bible. You're already holding it in your hand, okay? That's half the battle right there, right? So you, so you, you get up, you, you curse me, you walk across the room, okay? You pick up your Bible, you turn off your alarm, and then just keep walking to the kitchen, okay? And sit down, make yourself a cup of coffee, and just and spend 30 minutes. You're like, I don't know what to do. Go to jointhejourney.com. We'll help you. You can read the same thing I will tomorrow. You can think, man, this is the same thing. JP's reading, DMAR's reading, Todd Wagner's reading. We're all reading the same thing. 
be a short little scripture. You can read it. You can read a Devo. You can pray about it. I want you to do it tomorrow. You know what? I want you to do it for the next 30 days. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the next 30 days. You're like, 30 days? Yeah, 30 days. You're going to be okay. 30 days. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to wake up and you're going to think, you know what? I'll do that at lunch. No, you won't. Do it in the morning, tomorrow morning. You think, you know, I'll do it before I go to bed. Stop it. Stop making excuses. There's a lion in the road. There's a lion. No, stop. There's no lion. It's Dallas. Okay? It's, it's Texas. There's no lion. Pick up your Bible, walk to the kitchen, and get in that 30 minutes. And do it for 30 days. It'll be a habit after that. It will become easier and easier. I, I think so. You tell me if I'm wrong. Come back and say, hey, I did it. It wasn't easier. And, uh, but, but let's just do that. Just commit to doing that. Discipline yourself. The cure for, 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 for personal laziness is to grow in discipline. You know, working out, eating right. Uh, listen, this is something I struggle with. I mean, that's, you've heard me say a bunch of times, I've been here long, I hate working out. Because it's hard. It's not fun. Nothing fun about it. Not for me anyways. I, and you know what, when it comes to food, I like to eat whatever I want to eat. So I, I had my own resolutions. I started 2018 with a juice cleanse. Pray for me. Not eating anything solid, just drinking juice. My, my son, my five-year-old, is like, Daddy, why would you do that? I'm like, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, but, but here's why. Because I don't want to be a slave to my cravings. I don't want to be a slave to my body. I want my body to be a slave to me. I don't want to do what it feels. I want it to do as I feel, as I believe. Surrender to the Spirit, Right? And so I'm not just following those cravings. Think about, hey, how do I kill comfort in my life so that I would replace the desire for comfort with the desire for discipline, that I would honor God in the grind because the cause of laziness is a craving for comfort. The cost of laziness is a wasted life. And the cure for laziness is discipline. 1 Timothy 4 verse 7 says, that, that we're to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. And so if you're here and you're like, I want to be godly, what that scripture is saying is that you literally, that you can become godly through discipline. It says it right there in the scripture, that godliness comes by way of discipline. Not easy, not, not just because you feel like it, that sometimes you have to honor God in the grind. And, and you want to know the truth about me when it comes to drums? I ain't great. I'm not a great drummer, percussionist, if you will. Like, I could come up here and do my very best and try to fake it. I'd love to invite my friend Justin up here. That just happened. That's as good as I got. Why? I never practiced. I never disciplined myself. I, Justin, you've been playing the drum for what, 23 years? I just stepped on your tambourine, bro. I'm sorry. <laughs> 23. Justin and I have been at the porch since the very beginning. He's been a part of the porch band. And the dude could play the drum. Can you play the drums? Play the drums for them. It's like, it's like, it's just like I did. <laughs> See, I can hit those things with sticks, but I can't make it beautiful. I can't make it in beat. To, to do that takes control. It takes discipline. If you know anybody that's going to do something great with their life, they're either part of the less than 1%, or they disciplined themselves. And when it got hard, they pressed in. And they said, Lord, I don't want to do this, but not my will, thy will. What would you have me do? How would you use my life? Let me pray that you would. God, thank you for our friends that are here. And just the truth in the scriptures is these practical life lessons that, that can feel, feel a little bit like, you know, tips and tricks to, to living life, but the truth is you, you've called us to discipline ourselves for godliness. 
And God, some of us, and I, I'll start with me, I need to confess the sin of laziness. I don't like it when my wife leaves a list for me to do and I've got a bunch of tasks and I, I love to sleep in, God. I, I really, I love to do what I want to do. I love to feed my flesh. You gotta acknowledge that's not gonna produce greatness, an act of worship for you. And so, Lord, I, I want to present, we want to present our bodies as living sacrifices. Would you see them as holy and pleasing? That this would be our spiritual act of worship. Father, help us not to conform any longer to the patterns of this world. We God, help us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might be able to test and approve what your will is, your good, pleasing, and perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen.